Welcome everybody in this week's quantum information and quantum computing seminar at CTP. It's actually the first seminar in 2024. We have a, a pleasure to host virtually uh, Eva Borsuk from Institute of Nuclear Physics of Polish Academy of Sciences. So Eva is a graduate uh, student specializing in entanglement, uh, uh, photonics, uh, foundations of quantum mechanics and uh, yeah so today she will be talking about, uh, to us about how to generate entanglement in uh, non-touching scenarios uh, it's great to have you eva the the, the screen uh, is yours uh, yeah. thank you a lot uh, thank you for having me and for this opportunity so uh, today as it was said already i i want to share with you the results of my uh, phd studies that I did uh, in the Institute of Nuclear Physics, Polish Academy of Sciences. Uh, my supervisor is Professor Paweł Błasiak, and uh, today I have a great pleasure to show you how, uh, how I did during my PhD studies. Um, so uh, let me start with a brief uh, introduction uh, I have one technical question because I do not see the upper part of, of the slides where there is uh, a, a list of uh, subsections. Do you see it cl clearly? Because I, I yes, don't know, yes, but yes. you do. Okay, great. Uh, so uh, uh, going to, uh, to the introduction. Uh, as you all know, in uh, 1935, uh, Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen published uh, a paper that inspired uh, a viral discussion among uh, physics uh, community entitled Can Quantum Mechanical Description of Physical Reality Be Considered Complete? Uh, this paper was a source uh, for famous EPR paradox. Uh, there, uh, in that paper, Einstein and uh, his colleagues argued that uh, Due to some phenomena connected also to entanglement, uh, the uh, quantum mechanics are not complete. This is a theory that uh, needs some rebuilding, if not rejecting at all, that, uh, uh, that the cards are still on the table regarding quantum mechanics as a, as a theory, as a physical theory. Um, Bohr responded to it uh, with uh, negative point of view when uh, where he stated that uh, Einstein and uh, Podolsky and Rosen uh, simply had some more, uh, we can say, interpretational uh, issues regarding quantum mechanics and that in fact this theory is complete and uh, does not need any uh, more improvement in that, in that area that Einstein uh, pointed out with, with Podolsky and Rosen. Uh, as you can see, press was also interested in, in that exchange. We see a lovely title, Einstein Attacks Quantum Theory. I, I think that everyone one, at that time was very, very interested in, in that discussion. And it was not on, until uh, 1964 when uh, Bell added something uh, very important to that discussion. And that was, of course, uh, Bell inequalities and Bell experiment. So you can see on the um, left uh, hand side of the slide, we have uh, uh, the well-known example with Alice and Bob, uh, two inputs, two outputs uh, experiment, well, where a particle is sent to the very distant uh, laboratories. They make measurements, uh, they expect uh, that a certain inequality uh, would be uh, guaranteed. Uh, but, as we all know, for uh, quantum entanglement, uh, this uh, uh, inequality is violated. And that means that something off is happening, that something interesting is really happening with quantum mechanics. And that was, uh, basically was uh, the main motivation why I got into PhD studies, because I wanted to know what is so interesting about entanglement, about Bell inequality. And uh, that got me into uh, three main uh, research interests uh, that uh, I pursued during my PhD. Uh, 
And so the first research interest was entanglement generation in passive linear optical design in the so-called no touching uh, scenario. I will discuss the details of this no touching scenario in a moment. Uh, the second uh, research interest that I have uh, is its uh, usage of uh, uh, the usage of entanglement generation of these protocols for the purpose of fundamental tests, and thirdly, the causal meaning of the observed uh, violation of the inequalities, and that is connected to a great topic of uh, the work connected, for instance. Of, uh, of Duda Pearl, uh, when we can see some very interesting uh, causal correlations in the DAX. And uh, these three uh, research topics uh, were reformulated into three uh, research questions that would be the base for this talk. So, firstly, uh, first question is what is the range of entanglement states that can be generated in the no touching scenario? Which follows from that question is, of course, uh, the question of efficiency of those protocols, and I will discuss that as well. The second question uh, that I wanted to pursue uh, was, can those protocols be used for conclusive tests of Bell inequalities in presence of post-selection? And the issue of post-selection will be also discussed. And thirdly, uh, uh, what is the causal cost of violation of Bell inequalities? And hence, how do the causal assumptions compare one to another? So let me start with the first question. What is the range of entangled states that can be generated in the no touching scenario? What is the efficiency? Uh, so it uh, goes back to uh, 2019 when my supervisor, uh, Paweł Basiak and Marcin Markiewicz published, published a paper entangling uh, three qubits without ever touching. And when, where they introduced a new concept uh, for generation of entanglement, you know, the no touching scenario. It is a very simple design concerning passive linear uh, optics. The general scheme you can see on, on this slide, uh, it is uh, a scheme for n uh, particles. Uh, so as you can see, uh, we have n independent particles. So the, here there are dots. So we can imagine that there are n independent particles, n independent systems, i1, a2, up to an or a, ak, if, if you will. Uh, and we inject three independent particles into optical system, and uh, they are not entangled. This is the crucial part. We don't have any entanglement at the beginning. Then we have very simple local unitary transformations. Then we have uh, permutation of optical paths. Uh, at the end, uh, we do local unitary transformations one, one more. And then at the end, you can see these subsystems uh, B1, B2, up to BK. And from that, we uh, select uh, a, small, a smaller set. And this is the action of post selection, uh, where we make sure that the, at the end of, of the experiment, we get only one particle for each subsystem b bar 1, b bar 2, b bar 3, up to b bar k. And this is crucial part. At the end, we have post selection that makes sure that here there's only one particle in each output qubit. We also use dual rail encoding for the purposes of creating entangled state. Uh, let me show you a simple example how, how it works in practice. Uh, we will start with the, the Bell state. So uh, you can see that we have just two subsystems, A1, A2. We inject two particles at uh, optical path one and three. Then there are uh, Hadamard uh, matrices, which represent a local unitary transformation. Uh, this local unitary transformation can be implemented by a simpler, simple beam splitter. 
and then there is uh, permutation of optical paths and uh, at the end we uh, don't do any more local transformations uh, we just uh, check if uh, in uh, in subsystems by uh, b bar one and b bar two there are only one particle for each subsystem uh, it can be seen step by step using uh, creation operator and that's how we can get a bell state. Both for uh, it can be done both for bosons and fermions, and due to particle statistics, we can get plus or minus sign at the end. Uh, the same uh, the same can be done for uh, DHZ state, uh, where we have three particles. So we inject independent particles on the optical path one, three, and five. Uh, then we have once again, Hadamard matrices, the three of them, then we make a uh, permutation of optical paths, which is defined in uh, equation uh, 12, if you will. And then, um, once again, we just do a very simple post selection on uh, optical, uh, on output uh, qubits, uh, B1 bar, B bar 2, B bar three, we check that there is just one particle at the end in each subsystem, and we get a DHZ state. Uh, how far can we go with this uh, with this kind of uh, designs? That was the main uh, question that I had during my PhD studies. And the first publication uh, that I joined uh, was entitled arbitrary entanglement of three qubits via linear optics. It was published in 2022. And we uh, achieved uh, generation of arbitrary entanglement of three qubits. Um, how it was done? Firstly, uh, let me know that uh, uh, arbitrary entanglement of three qubits is not so complicated because uh, some may think that we need uh, nine terms in the state uh, that we, uh, we that we need to check to, to get uh, arbitrary entanglement of three qubits. Actually, it is not the case. Thanks to generalized Schmidt decomposition uh, published by Icing et al. in 2000. Uh, we can uh, use a simplified version uh, stated in equation 13, and one only needs some very simple uh, local unitary, some local unitary transformation to, to get uh, from this state to uh, the big uh, state with nine uh, terms. So it was nice because uh, it simplifies our our work, and the design uh, is uh, presented here. Mm. We have uh, we want uh, an entangled state of three qubits, so we have three particles at optical paths one, uh, six, and eight. We inject them; they are independent, not entangled. Uh, we have local unitary transformation u, uh, h, and u. These are the same. This is Hadamard matrix. Uh, then we have local unitary local unitary transformation v and w and at the end we have uh, as usual um, sub systems b1 bar b bar 2 b bar 3 and we check that at each uh, subsystem we have just one particle and it is all that is needed in order to create arbitrary entanglement of three qubits uh, what are the advantages of that scheme uh, so firstly, as I've said, uh, we only need passive linear optics uh, with three independent particles and non-entanglement is needed at the input. Uh, secondly, the design is quite simple. We only use optical paths, uh, local unitary transformations, permutation of optical paths, once again, local unitary transformation. And 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 with post selection on one particle at the end, uh, we get the arbitrary entanglement of three qubits. Uh, thirdly, entanglement can be obtained in dual ray encoding, and 
The last thing that I want to say about this protocol is that the efficiency, efficiency of, of this scheme is constant for any entangled state of qubits, and it is equal to approximately 5%. Mm. Now, uh, let's uh, jump into another. Sorry, Eva. Uh, yes? Can I ask? Can you give like some, uh, like, justification? Like, uh, I know that maybe it's, you know, the details and the computations and so on, but like some intuition why such a scheme works for, for this case of three qubits and dual real encoding. Uh, yeah. Why, why, why does it work? Like, it is technical. It is technical uh, question. I would say, uh, basically, when uh, when I look at it, I feel like we have parts that are well known, like local unitary transformations, uh, permutations, etc. Uh, if we combine them in a certain way, we can get uh, arbitrary entanglement. So you sort of uh, started with some. Can you move back? Yeah. So you started with this ansatz that you know uh, you have uh, on the first part you have this u on the third part you have this u, had numbers and then you like you played somehow with parameters if I understand. Uh, yeah. Well. well, yeah, like yes, uh, these uh, local unitary transformations are represented by uh, matrices, and uh, these matrices has to be. Uh, Defined in a certain way, uh, so that uh, so that uh, mm -hmm. the entanglement can happen. And uh, if you, because I didn't want to put it on the slide because it it mm -hmm. gets a little bit long. But basically, yeah. what happens is is analogous to this example with GHZ state. So mm -hmm. uh, uh, if we see, for instance, uh, that the particle goes through uh, the local unitary transformation. H, it, uh, yes. it, it, then it is uh, it is represented by this sum, uh, and uh, with uh, permutations of optical paths, we get at the end mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, creation uh, operators that are equivalent, mm -hmm. that are uh, good for uh, uh, for arbitrary entanglement of three qubits. So. And can I ask, so you need to perform post-selection somehow uh, simultaneously in many parties, not like independently, even on this, uh, right? This is the catch, mm -hmm. probably. Yeah, like, yeah, okay. yes, 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 probably. So the parties need to uh, uh, sort of communicate with each other uh, to... Mm, like, I don't, I think it is more or, of a, a technical question of implementation question, how, how to do it in a laboratory setting. Of that, mm -hmm. I am, I am not sure because uh, the, that uh, is just a theoretical thing. Mm, okay, okay, thanks. Please move on. Matt, can I also ask? Sorry. Um, oh, sure. So you started uh, talking uh, about um, optical elements and now you've moved on to talking about um, qubits, which are not exactly the same. Um, so is it essential that you start off with something that's fermionic or bosonic and has some like, because um, in some sense, like if I start off with a bunch of fermions, they're entangled to start with, right? Because of the indistinguishability. Okay. Yes. You, you can, uh, you can, uh, you can see that. Yes. Yes. Of course. What I mean, like, um, if you have slugs, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, you can uh, generate, I don't know, from uh, one GHZ state, another GHZ state, and mm. it is not the case here. Here uh, uh, we start with independent particles that do not have to be entangled in any certain way. In fact, they should be independent at the at the beginning. And they are. They're not entangled, but they mm -hmm. are. Okay. Like yes, yes, they are. They are not. Uh, we we just need. Uh, in this uh, instance, we need just three independent particles, local unitary transformation, permutation of optical path, then another local unitary transformation post selection, and we get entangled state. And but they have start... to be indistinguishable, right? I can't do it with like one electron and one photon or something. Yes, 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 yes. That that is correct. Okay. Uh, and also uh, regarding uh, qubits. What I mean by it, uh, because I think in the terms of dual rail encoding. So uh, 
uh, for me, this uh, pair one and two mm -hmm. is uh, dual rail encode uh, encode qubit. Uh, mm -hmm. that, this is what I need. Okay. Yeah. And uh, the same for, of course, for B two bar mm -hmm. and B three bar. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. For, thank you for for your question. Uh, can I move on? I, I think yes. No more questions. Uh, so uh, we have discussed already advantages of that scheme, and uh, as you uh, as I as you all know, uh, our main focus was how far can we go with this uh, with these optical schemes. And another challenge that we uh, that we got uh, was uh, multipartite multipartite uh, W space for n qubits. And it was also published in 2021 uh, in a paper, uh, Efficient uh, Linear Optical Generation of uh, Multipartite uh, W Space. And uh, as we have uh, n qubits, uh, we want n qubits, we need n particles. Uh, so uh, we start. Once again, with uh, n independent particles in each subsystem A1 up to AN. Then we have local unitaries U, G, and V, uh, permutation of optical path, while one uh, local unitary uh, G to power minus one at the end. And then um, we do the usual post selection on subsystems uh, B1, B2 up to BN. And we get uh, entangled state, uh, uh, multipartite uh, W state, uh, just as it is stated in equation 14. Uh, what are uh, the advantages of, of that scheme? Once again, we do not uh, need entangled states in order to create entangled state. Uh, we only use passive linear optics. Uh, there are no auxiliary particles. In the system, no auxiliary measurements needed, uh, no uh, feed-forward uh, correction needed. And the efficiency of, of our scheme uh, scales polynomially with the increasing number of particles, independently of, of uh, particle statistics. And uh, our efficiency is presented in, in this equation. Uh, we compared it with uh, the best, uh, to our knowledge, uh, scheme of uh, Kim, Cho, uh, Lim, and Han in a paper, Efficient Linear Optical Generation of Multiparty uh, W State via, quantum, via a Quantum Eraser. And uh, this gives a first difference between our schema because uh, they have a Quantum Eraser in, in, in their in their pro protocol, which might be challenging to, to implement. And also uh, they use uh, feed forward, which also gives another experimental cost, if I may call it so. Uh, yes? Uh, so Eva, can you, can you elaborate uh, briefly what is a quantum eraser? Uh, quantum eraser is, um, like uh, I am, I am, I'm not an expert on on that topic, but from what I understand, it is a concept of erasing part of information of uh, on the quantum system, as if it never happened, as if the system didn't have any memory of the past, if I may say so. Uh, and. Uh, and the uh, feed forward is also uh, a, a design which uh, gives us uh, some problems in, in the experimental setting. And uh, the comparison is uh, presented here on the right side of the slide. Uh, so our proposal is this green line. Uh, this blue, uh, uh, okay, it is not a line, but this, uh, um, Function. Let's say that's this uh, uh, blue function. It is a proposal of Kim at all uh, without feed forward. So this is what we get if we cut off feed forward, and uh, when we are left only with uh, quantum erasure. 
And uh, if we add uh, feed forward to the system of uh, Teams paper, then we get this, this orange line. So uh, the question is uh, whether we want to implement uh, more complicated uh, setting with feed forward, or are we uh, satisfied with, with uh, our proposal, which uh, does not include uh, uh, this complicated uh, protocol? Uh, which is uh, which concern only as if we are mm, that uh, that ends the first part of of my talk. Let me check what time is it. Okay, uh, so <laughs> I will try to rush a little because uh, we have three parts to discuss today. Uh, so the second part uh, is uh, is a following question. Uh, can those protocols, I mean no touching protocols, uh, can those protocols uh, be used for conclusive test of well inequalities in the presence of false selection? So, as you've seen, and uh, I, I showed you it uh, explicitly, each time uh, in our schemes we have false selection, and false selection is a procedure that is often used. Uh, not only in optical systems, but uh, generally speaking, in physics, we we always have some kind of detectors which uh, cut off uh, a part a part uh, of the data, which seem to be unnecessary. But the question is: Is that procedure so innocent? Is it is it not harmful at all to our data, to our statistics? And with that, uh, let me uh, present to you. Uh, something that is called uh, selection bias or Bergson's paradox. Probably some of you are uh, very familiar with, with this issue. Uh, I will start this part of my talk with very simple, uh, a little bit maybe funny example, but it uh, really gives a vibe what what I mean by Bergson's paradox. So imagine I have a friend who is an alien, who didn't live on Earth, uh, who moved here like one year ago or two months ago. And he sees uh, for the first time uh, Oscar Gala. And uh, he sees a lot of uh, actors that go to, to that gala to get Oscars. And uh, he says that he sees uh, a correlation, a negative uh, correlation among these actors. Uh, which is that uh, bad-looking actors are more often uh, uh, found to be uh, very talented actors. And that friend uh, posed a following question. Is it possible that black, uh, bad looks makes one more talented actor? As we, all not, uh, as we are not aliens, we all know that this question is absurd and that uh, bad looks has nothing to do uh, with being or not being talented. Uh, although we can all agree that this correlation really appears among, uh, among um, actors, uh, especially in, in Hollywood, uh, I think. Like, uh, we all have this experience that uh, sometimes a very good looking actor is not so much very talented and vice versa. A very bad looking actor is often found very talented. So what is going on here? And why this correlation does not appear among uh, humankind uh, worldwide? The answer is, of course, uh, the act of false selection, uh, the act of uh, conditioning of, on a very uh, uh, strictly defined demographic of actors. And uh, this para uh, paradox uh, can be very simply explained with uh, Causal directed acyclic graphs of the affair, uh, when, when we can just uh, write down uh, a variable talent, beauty, they both influence my uh, chances of becoming celebrity. And if you are familiar with, with that, that, you know that uh, this uh, path uh, is open, which means that these two uh, uh, variables are correlated. Nevertheless, that they are not uh, correlated in a causal way. It is a correlation that appears uh, non-causally uh, due to the statistics, due to conditioning on uh, being a celebrity. 
Uh, we can also uh, state it in a more formal way uh, using independent relations. Uh, we can use these causal DACs uh, with uh, functional relations. We describe it more precisely with a function and some variables. It, uh, it is very simple and it gives us a way to understand fully uh, this uh, Bergson's paradox. So uh, what, I'm say, what I try to uh, say to you today is that post selection may be harmful and we should take caution when, while using it. And uh, I want to show you an example uh, that was an inspiration for our uh, another paper of ours uh, on three box paradox, uh, which is a paradox from quantum mechanics. And uh, let me see how you see uh, this this paradox. Um, uh, one second. Okay, so um, Free Box Paradox was firstly published by in a paper of Aharonov and Weidman in 91 uh, in a paper entitled Complete Description of a Quantum System at a Given Time. Uh, in that paper, they presented a few results. One of them was Free Box Paradox, and it goes as follows. Um, imagine I have, uh, I have uh, a ball a particle, and I have uh, three optical paths, which I will call boxes. Uh, then I, I make uh, a preparation on initial state. Uh, so I inject uh, particle into, into the system, and uh, that uh, particle at the beginning is in the following superposition of being in one of three boxes, one, two, and three. Then at the end of experiment, I make a post selection, which is stated here. I want to make sure that after some transformations, uh, my output uh, state would look uh, like this, like it is stated in equation three. Not so, it is, nothing is so shocking uh, so far, uh, but interesting part uh, begins when I add additional intermediate uh, measurements in the middle of the experiment when I will check one of the boxes. So let's say I am a curious person. I want to know uh, uh, in, at the, in the middle of the experiment where, where the particle is, and I look into one of three boxes. So let's say I look into one, first the box uh, number one. Uh, I can either find the particle or not find the particle. It is uh, represented by standard uh, projective uh, measurement, uh, PVM. Uh, does it change anything? Does this experiment seem shocking to you? I think not. But let me show you uh, what happens in the statistics. If I ask anyone uh, what is uh, the probability of finding a particle in, of one of three boxes, everyone would agree that uh, the probability would be one third. One particle, three boxes, nothing more simple. But in the case of three box paradox, it is not the case. If I construct uh, an experiment in a way I've just showed you, uh, if I have three parts, preparation, measurement, post-selection, then uh, something strange happens. And each time I look into par uh, box number one, I see a particle with 100% probability. Uh, so I have 100% uh, chance of finding a particle in box one. Some, are, some may say that then it is impossible to find a particle anywhere else. But what is even more paradoxical is that when I look into box two, I also find a particle with 100% probability given a successful post selection. How that happens? That was the question that we wanted to answer. Mm, I uh, must tell you that uh, this paradox got a very various uh, responses uh, in the physics community. They were they were very interesting, uh, interesting uh, uh, 
very interesting ideas how to resolve that questions, even going to retro causality. Uh, but uh, we wanted to check uh, if, uh, if that paradox can be uh, answered in more a simple way. Uh, and with that, we used causal dots. Um, so the proposal of two causal dots, uh, you can see here. Um, uh, we have uh, pure causal dot and realist causal dot. Uh, with pure causal dot, we just assume that there is just a choice of a box outcome of the intermediate uh, uh, intermediate measurement outcome of uh, outcome of uh, post selection and lambda which is hidden variable um, that uh, that uh, describe the preparation of the system uh, we also uh, created another possibility which uh, we called realist causal dat and that uh, that possibility add to the picture uh, the assumption of realism, which means that basically uh, particles are found where they are. And, uh, and that we ensured by adding another variable V. So C is a choice of a, uh, of a, uh, choice of a, a box. V is a position of a particle before, uh, before uh, the measurement. And then the outcome of the measurement should be thus uh, delta chronicler of V and uh, V and C. Mm, if someone does not like that that idea, we can always go back to pure causal that. The question is: uh, Do we need additional arrows to explain that paradox? Uh, if yes, uh, which arrows are necessary and enough to explain the paradoxical statistics? The summary of the results are presented on this slide. Um, as you can see, there are a few possibilities. Uh, we discussed pure causal duck, realist causal duck. We also discussed uh, the statistics of checking just boxes one and two, as it is done in the original paper of Aharonov and Weinman. But we also checked uh, the full statistics of checking boxes one, two, and three that gave us uh, different uh, results. The uh, surprising part is that uh, when we just, uh, uh, when we just uh, look at the statistics of checking box one and two in pure causal case, we do not really see anything uh, marvelous. We just, uh, we can explain the whole phenomena by uh, some latent hidden variable uh, from, from the past, uh, from preparation of the system. With realist causal duck, you can see that the paradox can be explained by uh, measurement dependence, so the intermediate measurement influences the outcome of post selection, or by uh, choice of the box influences uh, the result of, of post selection. The same goes for the cases of uh, full statistics, both with pure causal ducks and real causal ducks. Uh, for these uh, structures, we also used instrumental inequalities that were uh, introduced by Judah Perl. Mm. In short, we can say that uh, free box paradox it is not so uh, paradoxical, that each time we have a direct influence on the outcome of post selection, and that uh, free box paradox can be seen just as a case of Bergson's paradox. Uh, that brings me to the uh, last uh, paper uh, that that we published uh, in that section. Uh, I mean uh, the publication on safe post selection for Bell tests with ideal detector causal diagram approach, published in 2021. Um, I hope I convinced you already that uh, post selection might be uh, problematic. And it gives us a real trouble concerning that our uh, our models, I mean, no touching uh, schemes, always use post selection. Uh, so uh, that's why we wanted to check if if that post selection is uh, troublesome or not. And let me uh, go back to Bell test. A simple Bell test with a multi-parted uh, scenario. Uh, so we have 
uh, it is represented on this uh, causal duck. We have Alice, Bob, Charlie, and so on, with ex uh, which have experimental settings X, Y, Z, uh, experimental outcomes A, B, C, and so on, and some um, hidden variable uh, lambda. As we all know, uh, this uh, causal structure is incomplete if, if we have a violation of Bell inequalities, uh, which means that we need to add additional arrow um, between variables. For instance, an arrow from Alice to Charlie's results, which would be responsible for non-local uh, non -local inputs. Uh, then, <clears throat> One may ask what happens if we add post selection to that picture. And let me uh, modify this causal DAG into a system which uh, concerns post selection. Uh, I have uh, once again uh, settings uh, X, Y, Z, and so on, outcomes A, B, C, and so on, uh, hidden variable lambda. And at the end, we have uh, post selection K. Uh, conditioning on post selection is represented by this uh, red uh, rectangular. Uh, and uh, if I have post selection that is successful, I mm, note it as k equals 1. If I have post selection that is uh, unsuccessful, I uh, note it as k equals 0. And uh, as I showed you, this post selection may be troublesome. It uh, may uh, add to our, to our data additional additional uh, statistics, additional correlation, I mean, not statistics, additional correlations. Uh, which means that, for instance, with this conditioning, I have open path from here, here to here, from here to here, and so on. So this, uh, uh, these variables get correlated. Uh, maybe not because of non-locality or some other influence, but because of the act of post selection. And uh, it is a big difference. And uh, to check if this is really the case, if our post selection uh, do that to, to our statistics, uh, we created all but one principle, which goes like this. If post selection confirms uh, to all but one principle, it can be determined without knowing one of the outcomes. So for instance, if I have uh, 10 optical paths, I assume that I don't lose any particles and I just want to have uh, 10 uh, particles at the end in one per each uh, uh, optical path. I don't need to check 10 of them. I just need to check nine. And I already know, uh, I already know uh, that uh, the post-selection is successful. And this is the type of post-selection we call uh, a post selection that confirms to all but one principle. We also defined a post selection that is safe because we consider Bell, uh, Bell scenario. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, assumptions of locality and free choice uh, hold even in the post selection regime. Uh, so I have uh, the assumption of locality, the assumption of free choice. And uh, these uh, assumptions uh, need to hold even if I condition uh, not only on the standard variables, but also if I add to, to the picture uh, conditioning of the outcome or post selection. By the way, I am sorry for that, but here after Z, we need lambda. It's uh, A, B, C given, given X, Y, Z, lambda, K, and so on. Uh, and the result of our our paper shows that uh, if post selection conforms to all but one principle, it is always safe. So we are safe. We do not need to worry uh, uh, about post selection in, in these instances. Uh, the data, even with post selection, can be used for conclusive tests uh, of Bell non locality. And uh, which is also good news for us. Our schemes of no touching protocols also confirm to all but one principle. Therefore, they are good for uh, Bell test, test as well. Mm. And that brings me to uh, the last uh, topic. Uh, sorry, can I, uh, can I ask about this last part you made? 
uh, mm -hmm. stuff just just like a sanity check so when you let's say have you generate j j z with some uh okay with some let's say small success probability as you explained in the first part of uh, of, of your talk then when you like once you I just wonder, uh, like, okay, like if you take into account the whole statistics, then you sort of have GAZ uh, state, like a mixture maybe of GAZ state and some something that you don't don't want. Uh, mm -hmm. let's yes, say. If yes. you uh, so it might well be that there is no uh, bell inequality that you know that the resulting state will be too noisy. I don't know to. Uh, uh, it's it's not the problem. Violate. No, yeah. no, no, no. Uh, sorry, sorry to jump in to catch you. No, no I, I might be wrong. You know, I just want to understand. Uh, yeah, the the thing is that uh, you are right that this, because the post selection in our system is is very precise. We want to have um, one particle per each subsystem uh, B bar, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And uh, it is not always the case. For I, I can surely imagine, and it is possible in in the scheme. That, for instance, in uh, B1 bar, I get two particles, not one. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this kind of run, I will just reject. But because of I uh, because of I reject it, I have post selection. Mm -hmm. And then, so okay. I, yes, and this is why uh, this uh, issue was uh, was discussed. Uh, okay, so then this is like a, some post selection on the level of mm. like. It's okay, when you when you apply this instrumental scenario, let's say, and mm -hmm. you you have this dag, and you sort of want... okay, you 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 are wondering. Okay, I'm not sure if I understand. You are wondering whether some by adding this post selection, you you have some unwanted, I know, classical correlations that would yes, uh, yes, mm -hmm. yes, that 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 would make uh, that would. Uh, Give other explanation for the for the violation of value inequality or something. Exactly. Like this. Exactly. Okay. Right. Okay. Exactly. You you summarize it or summarize it exactly how how it. Okay. How okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks. Okay. Well, we don't have time to like go through all the details, but yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, please go ahead. Uh, okay. Sorry. Can I have a question also? Sorry. <laughs> Of course. Uh, very quick one. Uh, I wanted to make sure uh, if I understand you correctly about the all but one principle so what you are saying is that if the correlations after like if the correlations afterwards are such that uh if you have like i don't know n particles and you consider only n minus one of them then this is if the knowledge of n minus one particles is enough to fully determine the whole thing then you are sure that the post selection did nothing yes, is that correct yes, exactly, okay okay exactly but right. but the opposite is not necessarily true uh, what do you mean by opposite? So, uh, like, because this is like the implication. So, for every non uh, non post selection kind of thing, we don't have this. So there can be something which is also not the cause of post selection, but do not admit to this principle that uh, this all by but one principle. Let me reformulate because I am not sure if I get you right, but. Uh, what I'm saying is that uh, post selection that confirms to all but one principle is always safe. But uh, if I can imagine, yes, I think I can, but I'm going to just uh, with my intuition that I can imagine a safe post selection that does not confirm mm -hmm. it, uh, to all but one principle. Uh, and also, uh, safe post selection is a notion that we uh, defined in our paper. Uh, what is uh, really uh, um, troublesome, it is a phenomenon uh, that is uh, called, uh, one second, uh, it is uh, this uh, portion of, uh, um, of a duck, this part of the duck, when uh, you see this, uh, I, when I have A going to uh, K and uh, C going to K, I have two arrows that point head to head, right? Mm -hmm. This kind of uh, positioning of, on the variable is called a collider. So 
K in that instance is a collider because of these two arrows head to head. Okay, imagine that there are no more. And uh, conditioning on collider opens the path. So it opens the path, so these two become correlated. And it is the same as it was in uh, the case of, uh, of uh, beauty and celebrity. You see, we have a collider, uh, a collider celebrity. Uh, we condition on being a celebrity. And then these two uh, uh, variables get correlated, although they are not causally correlated. OK, yes. Thank you very much. Great. Mm, so uh, I have a question regarding our time, because I can see that I have just five minutes. And yes, have... so uh, yeah, there, were, there was quite some discussion during uh, during your talk. So I propose, let's say, that we, that you try to finish maybe like in 15 minutes. OK, yes, 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 yeah. of course. Uh, so, um, so I will just uh, drink a little. And... By the way, this is herbal tea. I, I really like herbal tea. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, so uh, the third part of my talk is uh, goes to more uh, fundamental questions. Uh, and the third research question that I proceed was, what is the causal cost of violation of bell inequalities? And hence, uh, how do the causal assumptions compare one to another? Mm. Let me start with uh, a simple causal DAP which represent uh, bell inequalities, uh, not bell tests, sorry, not inequalities, bell tests. Uh, so uh, I have, as uh, usual, two parties, Alice and Bob, uh, experimental settings X, Y, a hidden variable lambda, which is responsible for the preparation of, of the test. And I have our experimental outcomes A and B. As, and as we already discussed, we know that for entangled states, uh, this uh, causal picture is incomplete, and we need to add uh, at least one uh, causal arrow in order to explain um, what is going on in the Bell test. Mm. There are a few options. Uh, I just listed a few of them. So, for instance, I can imagine that there is a violation of uh, locality. So I have some direct influence uh, of, I don't know, Alice settings on Bob's results or vice versa. Uh, I can have violation of free choice. So uh, maybe some uh, hidden variable influences uh, the experimental settings. Uh, it is also possible to consider violation of forward in time causation because in causal ducts there is no preferable uh, arrow of time. So I can always draw a duck when uh, there are some influences going backward in time. So for instance, uh, the, uh, I don't know, uh, the box settings influence the hidden variable, which later influences Alice, uh, Alice result. Uh, we published a paper about uh, these possible influences because we wanted to understand uh, how uh, how to describe uh, bell inequalities and uh, bell assumptions, namely locality, free choice, uh, forward in time causation as well. Uh, we decided to not to discuss for uh, uh, retrocausality, also known as uh, uh, backward in time causation. Uh, so we postulated that uh, causes proceed. Uh, effects in time and that arrow in time goes accordingly. And we all also uh, tried to discuss only one violation at time. So we only discuss uh, one additional arrow of locality or one additional arrow of uh, free choice. Of course, combinations are possible. And also, um, should I add something more? Yes, uh, the question was in the terms of frequency. So we wondered if uh, violation of locality and or free choice uh, has to happen at each experimental trial or maybe 
just as some instances. I can tell you right now that it is not at each time that you need a violation of features or, or locality to get experimental results of the test. Uh, first, let me discuss uh, a hidden variable model for violation of locality. Um, so the assumption of locality is presented in equation 18. I have some possible causal ducts that describe this uh, violation of locality. Uh, in hidden variable uh, space, uh, I uh, divide it into uh, two uh, subspaces. Uh, one is responsible for the instances when locality holds. Another uh, subspace uh, is responsible for instances where locality does not hold for some uh, experimental set. I can do the analogous uh, thing to the assumption of free choice. Uh, so uh, assumption of free choice boils down to this independence relation. I have causal ducts that uh, uh, represent a violation of free choice. And uh, as it was shown in the previous uh, slide, uh, I create a hidden variable model on a hidden variable space that I divide into two uh, subspaces. One of them, uh, lambda f, describes uh, instances where uh, free choice assumption holds. Another uh, another uh, subspace uh, describe uh, describe instances where post selection uh, uh, sorry not uh, another uh, uh, one part uh, one sub uh, one subspace describe instances when free choice assumption uh, hold another subspace describe uh, instances where uh, post uh, when um, Free choice, sorry, free choice assumption uh, fails, uh, fails for some uh, experimental settings. Mm. So how often, how often do we need to break locality assumption or free choice assumption? Uh, we created two measures, measure of locality, mu L, and mu, uh, measure of uh, free choice, mu F, and they were defined as follows. So uh, measure of locality is maximal fraction of trials in which Alice and Bob do not need to communicate trying to simulate a given behavior for each distribution of settings Txy. And uh, this uh, fraction is optimized over all conceivable hidden variable models with freely chosen uh, settings. And uh, the formal definition is stated in equation 24. Uh, simultaneously, we created uh, a definition for measure of free choice, mu f, which uh, is defined as a maximal fraction of trials in which Alice and Bob do not grant free choice of settings in trying to simulate a given behavior for each distribution of settings Txy, optimized over all conceivable local, uh, this time local, hidden variable models. You can see that for measure of free choice, we grant locality. For the measure of uh, locality, we grant free choice. And uh, uh, the uh, formal definition of measure of free choice is, is stated in equation 25. We also prove that these definitions can be simplified. We can drop uh, the minima in the equations, so uh, uh, measure of locality uh, can be defined as uh, as it is stated in equation 2026. 20, uh, the measure of free choice is uh, defined as it is stated in equation 27. So and just to clarify, so does it mean that uh, the functions uh, itself is independent on the distribution of uh, of, uh, in the, of the settings? Or because uh, like... It, it is uh, red... Like uh, it is in the appendix, like there is a formal proof why we can do it. Uh, but basically we use isomorphism uh, in order to show that it is the same if we check one uh, PXY, uh, it is the same for other PXY. So that's why we can drop it. Uh, Does it make oh. sense? 
Okay, it's um, okay. I'm not like I imagine. Okay, it's it's a bit weird. Okay, I I don't follow the details, but I can imagine very specific distribution uh, uh, on the settings p x y, namely that just some specific setting is used all the time uh, by uh, Alice and Bob. Uh, yes, right? this is yes, this is one of the options that uh, that was proved for arbitrary uh, distribution of settings. Okay. Okay, please go ahead. Maybe I can explain later. Yeah, yeah. yeah. please, please do. Uh, so, um, so uh, the violation of Bell um, assumptions. Uh, what can we say about the frequency of these violations? Uh, the main results are presented here in in uh, my la uh, almost last slide. Uh, the next one is is just a summary. Uh, so I think we are good with time. Uh, okay, so the summary of the results on measures of locality and free choice. We proved uh, four theorems. Mm, each of them gives a different vibe on measures of locality and free choice. The first two uh, consider any statistics that do not have to be uh, quantum mechanical. Uh, the last uh, two theorems concern uh, quantum mechanical states. The main result of the paper is presented in uh, theorem one, and it says that for any statistics, uh, for arbitrary number of settings, uh, in fact, the measures of locality and free choice are the same. So the frequency of violating either locality or free choice in the case of violating the Bell inequality is just the same. In that sense, uh, these assumptions have the same weight, if, if I may say so. Uh, secondly, we calculated explicitly in the case of non-signaling uh, to input to output scenario, Bell scenario. And uh, we showed uh, that uh, the measure of uh, locality and free choice equal to one half four minus s, uh, where s is an expression in uh, CHSH inequalities. Uh, so that gives us a quantitative uh, value of uh, violation of either locality or free choice. And what is nice is that we can calculate Explicitly. So, for instance, if I have a violation of Bell inequality that is uh, in the range from 2 to 2 square 2, I can uh, calculate explicitly uh, how many times I need to violate uh, either locality or free choice assumptions assumption in, in that instance. Uh, going to quantum statistics. In the quantum statistics, we considered uh, maximally entangled state, a bell state, and also two, two qubit state uh, that is not maximally entangled. Uh, this result, you can see uh, they are marked uh, with uh, blue color. It is because they were inspired by two uh, uh, publications, one of Alice Alice to uh, Popescu and uh, Rolich, uh, quantum non-locality for each pair in an ensemble. And the second inspiration goes from Portman and uh, Brandsiart or, and uh, Gisson, uh, local content of all pure two qubit states. Uh, with these uh, two papers as a foundation, uh, we were able to calculate uh, what happens uh, when we increase the number of, uh, of, uh, for instance, measurement settings. Uh, so, uh, in theorem three, we proved that uh, local uh, measure on of locality and measure of free choice uh, goes to zero with uh, the number of uh, settings uh, going to infinity. And for two, two qubit state uh, that is uh, not maximally entangled uh, with any number of settings, 
uh, the measure of locality and free choice oscillate as cosinus of theta. And that's it for me, uh, from me for today. Uh, let me summarize by showing you this uh, mind map of the research topics I, um, I, uh, uh, I've looked into during my PhD uh, studies. I hope I convinced you that uh, these topics are connected one to another. Uh, because uh, when we have uh, such a broad topic as entanglement generation, even in the no patching scenario, uh, we can always look into a few aspects. I wanted to see uh, two, uh, two sides of the coin. So firstly, I wanted to see causal aspects. Uh, with that, uh, I wanted to check uh, for instance, Bell experiment, see what uh, it says to me regarding uh, locality and free choice assumption. Causal aspects are also connected to uh, Bergson's paradox, to issues to, of post selection. Uh, that was illustrated in the case of uh, free box paradox, but it also helped me to uh, uh, create uh, all but one principle, which uh, was used in all cases. Uh, which can be applicable in all uh, protocols that I showed you today. Uh, I mean, uh, Bell space um, protocol, GHZ protocol, the protocol for generating arbitrary entanglement of three qubits, as well as multi parted W state. This is uh, a slide with the list of publications uh, I worked on during my PhD studies. And with that, uh, Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Eva, for a very nice uh, and insightful talk and uh, yeah, presenting us this like, impressive lineup of, of works. Uh, thank, thanks again. We have now some, some time for questions or comments to the speaker. So unmute yourself. And... Uh, I have a question, but it's a very specific one. So maybe if someone has a more general, they can start. Uh, no, okay. Uh, so uh, I, I have a question about the DAGs because uh, specifically, how do you construct a proof to show that a distribution is one or the other, follows one or the other? Mm -hmm. Yes, it is a very nice question. So uh, let me go back to the most simple case, maybe. Um, so we will see once again uh, beauty, talent, and celebrity. Um, so um, I have variables. I have data set, uh, uh, which is represented by these uh, words, I mean, talent, beauty, celebrity. Then uh, I have uh, a probability distribution. So I have uh, a correlation uh, where I can see some probability distribution. Uh, what is the probability of, I don't know, being a celebrity uh, uh, given into a consideration that I'm also beautiful? Or maybe uh, what is the probability of being a celebrity if I am talented and beautiful at the same time? Mm -hmm. This can be easily constructed uh, or gained. If, if you are ac have access to data, I don't know, experimental data, then you, you can calculate it quite easily. And then uh, we create functional relations. Uh, functional relations that correspond both to uh, the representation of causal DAG as well to your data, as well to probability uh, distributions. And all these parts together construct what, uh, what is meant by, uh, by a model, a, a causal model. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is a very good book on it, uh, which is entitled Causality by Judea Pearl, which summarizes all of it uh, very, very nicely. If you are interested, I really encourage you to, to look into it. Okay. And also, if uh, someone is interested in more in more light uh, version of, of that book, because this one, is, it is very uh, hardcore. <laughs> like it is uh, a book that uh, got uh, Pearl a very noble prize. I, I don't, I don't mean Nobel Prize, the Nobel Prize, but a very big prize uh, in a community, uh, well-respected one. Uh, so, uh, causality by Judah Pearl is if you want to get serious with causality. If you want to just uh, take a bite and try it, try it out. There are also 
I believe uh, a few books that are more like popular science, but it is on a higher level than popular, the regular popular science book. I do not recall the title, but uh, it is Przyczyny i Skutki in Polish. Uh, okay. I don't, I, I don't recall how it is in, in English. Okay, thank you very much. Maybe causes and effects. I am sure. Um, okay, any other questions or comments? Whoever. Uh, yeah, hi. Thank you for a, a cool talk. Um, I have a, a very dumb question. So, um, maybe maybe this is overly naive, but let's say um, I interpret the first part of your talk, these entanglement generating protocols, mm -hmm. as something like um, you're trying to harvest entanglement from the the indistinguishability of particles, right? It uh, works. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, what do you mean by harvest? Did I hear it? So well? we, we, in some sense, we there's some entanglement present in the wave function of, let's say, a, a pair of photons or a pair of electrons, or because of the fact that they're indistinguishable. And you're trying to take this entanglement, which is kind of there, and turn it into something that we can use in protocols. This is what I mean by harvest. Um, I see what you mean. I think it is a valid interpretation. But mm -hmm. I am not sure if, uh, like, if it is really what we are, what we are uh, looking at in, in okay. that in that sense. Like, uh, so yeah, this is sort of my question. My question is, um, can I play this? Can I make a scheme that looks like this mm -hmm. without the the ingredient that these are indistinguishable particles to start with? Like, does it, is there any hope at all of this working? No, or, no, yeah. no, 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 no. So this we is why need, I think, we need, uh, in yeah, the, okay. in the so this is why I think particles. this is what's going on, because this is like a, a very key ingredient. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, so, thank you. Thank you for that intuition. I think like uh, this comment is uh, very insightful. Thank well, you. Well, okay, this is not my, I have a question. <laughs> oh, <laughs> like, sorry, <laughs> okay. This is, this is just Go me trying ahead, to understand please. what's going on. So my question is, if this is kind of what we're doing, there is some entanglement in this wave function because indistinguishable and, and we're getting it. Is it is it obvious that we need post selection to do this? Is because it somehow there isn't yeah, is it possible that we could do this without post selecting somehow? I don't think so. And I also don't think so, but I don't uh, uh, my uh, question is do we know? Has anyone has anyone proved like, it? Uh, it is uh, um, uh, let's go to that slide, for instance. It is not the question if we cannot do it mm -hmm. like at least uh, i can imagine a protocol which does not involve post selection for sure okay. but does this protocol works does uh, work does this protocol uh, generate entangled state mm -hmm. uh, with that i think that we should uh, look to it uh, more uh, in precise in more precise way mm -hmm. because uh, at least from uh, the perspective of the pro of uh, of making this uh, scheme possible of uh, uh, of the project uh, mm -hmm. that you can see here, um, post selection is immanent part of that yeah. uh, of of that uh, particular protocol. So mm -hmm. if I cut off uh, post selection mm -hmm. in this uh, protocol, the scheme would not work. Yeah, yeah, but it would be cool to like have a a proof that says you actually need post selection as an ingredient in a protocol like this. Oh, you want to prove it that we yeah, need Yeah, because I think it's probably true that you do need post-selection. It looks true, but mm -hmm. I don't know why. You mean post-selection to generate entanglement? It's all... Yeah, like it, okay. it would, because these protocols work really cleanly and nicely if you have post-selection. Yeah. Um, exactly. And they don't if you don't, but it would be interesting to prove it. Yeah, like the, I, 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 I get what you mean. I think that post-selection is something that is almost always uh, present in uh, physical experiments. Like, yeah. if you think about it, I I, I cannot name a, a, an experiment, which may, maybe I can, but uh, uh, from the top of my head, most of the experiments have some kind of post selection. Because uh, detectors have, uh, I don't know, they have a certain range in which uh, they see a particle, for instance. Mm -hmm. Or maybe uh, we are interested only in uh, certain spins and other are not uh, interested, mm -hmm. interesting to us. Or maybe we want to have, um, I don't know, some decay 
in, uh, in, particle, uh, in particle physics. Uh, so when we uh, just pick up uh, a certain decay, we also post that. So uh, uh, the, the thing is that we almost always do post selection, I think. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, okay I just, please, please. I also okay. wanted to comment, but you, you, okay. are, you have priority. Okay, well, I, I just wanted to comment on Oliver's uh, insight. I think you have it, you have it right. Uh, so uh, our orig original motivation was that, uh, well, you said that there is entanglement in the beginning, but of course that's entanglement in the first quantization, right? If you symmetrize the wave function. But if you look at, but we know that then we have to, uh, switch to the second quantizations and that's what we use that because we cannot, we cannot do any experiment that we wish with, with, in the, with indistinguishable particle. So we move to the uh, mode description in which, you know, if you look, you know, like bluntly uh, at the expression, it seems that, you know, there, there is a one particle which was created in the Mars. The, the other one was created on Earth. Right. So are those particles entangled and in what sense can we use it somehow? They were independent. Uh, there were they uh, there was no source. Right. So they were just randomly uh, created. And can we somehow, you know, harvest, as you say, this uh, 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 this entanglement, so to say, in the first quantization uh, to see it in the second uh, quantization that we use and we do have access to? Uh, and apparently we can, of course, the price is uh, that we have to use uh, post-selection, uh, but of course this post-selection can be used, for example, for useful uh, Bell tests in which uh, in which we prove uh, non-locality. So, well, uh, so the original, at least my, my interest is uh, the foundational side. Does it mean that uh, since we have all the particles are indistinguishable, does it mean that we are um, and non-local from you know the very origin? Uh, are we non-local? So these kind of questions, uh, uh, I think we are interested in. I should also say that uh, that those protocols work equally well uh, for uh, fermions and bosons, and due to this post selection. You can be sure that those particles have never met. That's why it's called no touching because there's simply you know you can arrange those uh, those permutations in a way that you know particles never meet in those run when you make this post selection. So how come you know they become entangled? That's even more weirder weirder from the uh, foundational point of view. Um, yeah, I think, uh, but, and, and the question whether you can do this and uh, to what extent, uh, just with the interior transformation, that's a good question, uh, yes. which we haven't looked at. Yes, thank, thank you. Thank you a lot for that comment because uh, now I see that, yes, I, I didn't explain why we call uh, our protocols no touching. So yes, this is, this is the reason because particles do not meet at any point of, of, our, uh, of our scheme. So uh, can I have just a comment I wanted to, to make, make earlier, but so uh, so I guess here you, you, you talk about uh, uh, entanglement in dual real encoding, but yes. you could as well maybe be talking about entanglement in, in modes across those uh, like subsets of modes, B1, uh, B1, B2, B3 and so on without post, uh, like without like when you don't post select, uh, when you don't post select, and then it's uh, it's okay. Initially, the, the the state is uncorrelated in modes, mm -hmm. okay. But then operation that you apply, it doesn't have like a blocks because of those permutations. Uh, it doesn't have block structure, uh, like in across those uh, across those blocks. So it's in principle possible that the state that you get. Is somehow more more than tangled, like in a somehow weird way, because you you may end up with uh, you know more than one particle like uh, in one uh, in uh, in one subset of modes, right? Uh, but it will be still maybe formally entangled state. Yes, yes, I, I think so. Like uh, also, I, I didn't say that during the talk, but 
uh, it does not have to to be only dual rail encoding. We uh, we used in one of our papers an equivalent schema. Uh, I mean, we showed first we show this uh, usual uh, schema for uh, scheme uh, for protocol uh, with dual rail encoding as uh, the one you can see here. Mm -hmm. But then we showed an alternative. Uh, with uh, horizontal and vertical polarization. So like, mm -hmm. you can switch from one uh, type okay. Okay. Uh, of protocol to another. Yes. Okay. Uh, some other, I have one, uh, some questions that maybe at the very end, but maybe there are some other questions or comments to, to Eva. Uh, okay. If not, I have. Uh, uh, two uh, uh, questions more on the like personal side. So in in those in those uh, out of those five papers or like say three groups uh, of papers, which one you enjoyed working the most? Let's say the segment generation, the uh, uh, co uh, co uh, like causal relations uh, or uh, the uh, those three boxes thing. Uh, let's say this is one question. The second is what are you? What, do you want to? I know that you are maybe leaving academia, but is it like a permanent say, decision to, to leave academia or you still would be potentially interested in staying in it? Yeah. Well, yeah, so, okay, thank you. Thank you for those questions. So, um, which one first? Maybe about papers. Uh, so, um, my favorite paper was about Freebox Paradox. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I, I loved it. I've uh, I've dived into it uh, into all the details. I loved the discussions that uh, took place after the publication of Aharonov and Weidman, because the comments uh, were amazing. Like uh, if you have free time, it is an uh, mm -hmm. absolute uh, marvelous read. Uh, because um, as I've told you, like Aharonov and Weidman. Uh, propose a uh, retro causal model in, in their mm -hmm. paper. Uh, they propose weak values, uh, weak measurements. Uh, mm -hmm. So, all this for free box paradox. And uh, some people say that it is too far, that uh, it can be non local phenomenon, that it can be just uh, interpretational uh, issue, that uh, Maybe uh, we have a problem not really with physics, but more with understanding uh, the logical structure of, of the paradox. Uh, I've seen mm -hmm. one, one uh, paper uh, that was from a more philosophical angle, where, where uh, an author mm -hmm. pointed out that uh, the way uh, the theses are constructed makes uh, a contradiction, mm -hmm. makes a paradox. Uh, there were papers that, that showed uh, that it can be reproduced with some card game, for instance. So mm -hmm. uh, that that was mm -hmm. uh, a journey. I, I really liked it. I also liked uh, causal models in general. The, that mm -hmm. was a, a topic that I loved. And uh, and our uh, fallacy linear optics, they were also very nice. Like I, I really uh, enjoyed it. They were very... Mm, like I calculated them, I calculated all of them. I calculated uh, efficiencies uh, in them as well, and uh, they were very uh, nice to calculate. Like I, I enjoyed that mm -hmm. work. Uh, NAS was the most challenging one. Uh, that was the one uh, that uh, happened just at the beginning of my PhD. Mm -hmm. So I was a fresh. Uh, uh, student, fresh PhD candidate, and the first topic that I got uh, was uh, PNAS, uh, was uh, mm -hmm. the weight of, of Bell assumptions, mm -hmm. uh, but I handled it as I could the best. Uh, and uh, and that's, that's basically the story behind these papers. Yeah. Uh, about uh, my future, uh, I really don't know. Like I, I, I really liked my experience during PhD. Uh, I I also very like my job right now. Uh, I needed to find uh, one because you know that period uh, before and uh, between ending PhD studies and uh, getting uh, the defense 
takes some time. So uh, yeah. that's why I, I, I decided to get a job. Uh, the company is very, I, I really like the people I work with. And I will see, I will see. I am not a fan of uh, abroad exchange and uh, of uh, postdocs uh, abroad. So that's mm -hmm. why I'm staying in Krakow for now, but we will see. Uh, sure. Uh, thanks, Eva, for, for, this ex uh, for this explanation. Uh, right. And uh, so I guess with that, we need to uh, conclude the seminar. Uh, thanks, everybody, for yeah for, st uh, for sticking uh, uh, along with us. Yeah, I enjoyed uh, the talk very much. Thanks again, Eva, and, uh, and, and Pavel for, for joining us.